welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Rebecca Berger. This is Justice for All, where we get to speak to legal professionals in the surrounding area. We have an amazing guest with us here tonight, Robert Perry from Rosenberg and Perry and Associates. Rob, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me. So I'm glad that you were able to be available for this interview. Always make time for you. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about what led you to a career in law. Was it something that you always wanted to do? Or? In a moment of honesty, I would tell you that it has to do with my college schedule. So <laughs> I arranged my classes. And the crazy thing is I do believe that. It's yeah. the truth. So it starts off with me not wanting to get up early to go to class in college. And if you remember in the 90s, you almost couldn't turn on the television without Law & Order being on. You remember the A&E yes, channel? Yes. Law and Order, 24 hours a day. Well, and it still happens now. It right? still happens yes. now. So I would, I had a routine. I would get up whenever I got up, eat my cereal, watch my Law and Order, and then go to class. And, I, and, and you know, thought that was a good show, but that was my routine. And then uh, when I was, in my junior year, I had an opportunity to intern in Washington, D.C. So my, the college I went to had a program where you went for a semester, mm -hmm. you got full credit interning wherever you wanted to intern. Uh, so, you know, you're only this arrogant when you're 20. So I have this, <laughs> the, the, yeah, these opportunities <laughs> to uh, intern, you know, there's the White House, there's Congress and Capitol Hill. And, and uh, you're yeah. invincible at that. Uh, yeah, I, I was Absolutely just, invincible. I was too good for the White House. I mean, you gotta understand <laughs> that. So um, my advisor, uh, there was an opening for a public defender. And mm -hmm. I, I thought, well, I like law and order. Let me give that a shot. So I worked for this absolutely amazing attorney. She was very aggressive, uh, had a lot of empathy for her clients, and represented uh, some people charged with very, very serious offenses. So you were working on real cases at oh, that yeah. point. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I was, you know, 20 years old going into Anacostia and s some neighborhoods that I should not have been in after dark <laughs> looking for witnesses, and, and uh -huh. in the same breath, uh, I got a chance to do some legal research. It was a great opportunity, and I, I just... I fell in love with it. So when I came back to college, that was it. And the, the added bonus was that if you took uh, something akin to a law class in college, you had these big books that you could carry around and really look smart while you're walking around on campus. So that was that, <laughs> so was, that, how, that yeah, that was another me. another yeah. reason. So, so that that was you know, like I said, it started with with just my college schedule and watching Law and Order. And ever since then, that's what I wanted to do. So when you were in law school, was there any particular area that interested you that you felt compelled to to go into once you completed law school? Yeah, I criminal law was always what I had a passion for. Mm -hmm. uh, I do you think it was because of your internship or yeah, I, or I, that I, law and order? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. There was there was a Jack McCoy influence there. So. Uh, you know, you know how it is. You go into law school, and your mm -hmm. first year, you have to take everything. You have to mm -hmm. take contracts. You have to take torts. You have to take property. And you know, t to me, those classes were. It was about as interesting as watching paint dry mm -hmm. when you when you're reading all those cases. And criminal law was always just a little more exciting, uh, a little more, uh, a little more litigation based too. Mm -hmm. I knew I didn't want to sit behind a desk all day, so I, I was always drawn to criminal law. And then when I was in law school, I, I figured, well, you know, because when I came out of that internship, uh, I was going to, you know, fight for civil rights and fight for, <laughs> you know, save the world and all that. So you were going to be an ACLU absolutely, lawyer? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hook, line, and sinker. And then I figured, well, I'll do a recon mission. And oh, I'll, no. work for, I'll work for the prosecutor's office for just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that'll let me see behind the curtain, and then I'll go back to saving the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, that became a, a decade-plus recon mission where mm -hmm. I was at the prosecutor's office for over 10 years, uh, and then I found my way back to being a defense attorney. So during your time at the prosecutor's office, what was your experience like there? It was a great experience. It, it was a great experience. And I think for, especially for younger attorneys mm -hmm. to, who want to try cases and uh, be on their feet in front of a jury, it, it, you almost can't get it many other places. 
it gives you an opportunity to see behind the scenes of what goes into a criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. It you know lets you see what goes on in a grand jury room, which is which is secret. You never get mm -hmm. to see that unless you're a prosecutor or in the grand jury. And it, it also is a it is a team uh, team like atmosphere where mm -hmm. you walk down the hall and if you have an issue, there's great great talented prosecutors who. Mm -hmm have been doing this for 20, 30 years, and they've seen what you're going through right now, that mm -hmm. particular legal issue, and there was a lot of uh, great mentors. I loved being a prosecutor. It was, it was really a great experience. So were there any cases for you that were really memorable that you would say, wow, that really made me change the way I practice law? I had some great opportunities to do what's called second chair, where you, you assist the main prosecutor on the case. And uh, one case in particular where uh, early on I second chaired in a homicide case with an incredibly gifted attorney. Uh, and that was just an education from start to finish. Watching the way he prepared a case, the way he would go about evaluating a case was, uh, it was just, there's nothing to compare it to. There were, there were also cases that were, uh, criminal law is an emotional mm -hmm. business. Yeah. You know, you're dealing with people's freedom. You're dealing sometimes in cases where if people are convicted, they're, they're never going to get out of prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some cases that significantly impacted the way that I view cases. W one of them in particular I remember, uh, I prosecuted uh, a young man who had committed an armed robbery. He had, um, he and another person. Uh, had held a woman up at gunpoint, and they had uh, they had taken her belongings, and uh, it, it was not a whodunit. I mean, there was compelling evidence that he had committed the crime, and, and we we negotiated a resolution in the case. And you know, whenever whenever you plead guilty in superior court to mm -hmm what you would think of as a felony charge, there's always that waiting period before someone's sentenced. And in New Jersey, we don't call them felonies, we call them indictable charges. Right, right. I, I usually say, look, they don't, they don't call them felonies and misdemeanors, they call them crimes and offenses, but for our conversation, I'm just saying felonies and yes. misdemeanors, they're the same <laughs> thing. So there was a delay in between the guilty plea and the sentencing, and in between, uh, in between that, I, I uh, I had my first my first kid, so my son was born, and I'd taken some time off, and I had come back to the office a few days before the sentencing in this case, and uh, while we were waiting for the case to get called, I looked into you know into into the seats, and he was there with um, really what looked like almost a newborn son, mm -hmm. and you know you always, you always know that prison is not a good place and it's it's a dramatic consequence but it, it hit home to me certainly as I was as I was sitting there thinking that I I have this newborn son and I'm going to get to see meaningful events in his childhood I'm gonna be able to see him take his first step mm -hmm. say his first word eat his first solid food you know throw up on me the first time yeah. all those things that parents go through experience. and as I was sitting there waiting for him to be sentenced you know it occurred that he he's gonna miss a good bit of that he's not gonna be around for all those meaningful moments and I, I don't say that to suggest that the sentence he received was unfair or mm -hmm. excessive or anything like that but I, I think it did bring home the to me at least mm -hmm. uh, how, how really impactful incarceration is on somebody mm -hmm. when you you miss out on all those parts of your life while you're while you're incarcerated so and I think that sometimes people don't understand as a prosecutor I think that you have a lot of power to do quite frankly your job is to do the right thing whatever that may be and how did that impact you in terms of, because I know that there's this theory, oh, every prosecutor is like, everybody should be in jail, but that's not really the philosophy for the majority of prosecutors as I know them. Couldn't agree more. Um, the, the, the vast majority of prosecutors have altruistic motives. The vast majority. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the ones who are bad apples are usually the ones who make the news or wind up in some ethics opinion. 
but the vast majority of prosecutors are doing exactly what their job is, which is to do justice. And that's mm -hmm. what a prosecutor's job is ultimately to do, to do justice. And the prosecutor has a unique place in the criminal justice system because I, as a defense attorney, I'm an advocate for my client. I'm not there to do justice. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if my client is guilty, it's still my job to do everything I can uh, within the rules to obtain the best possible outcome I can for my mm -hmm. client. That's not what a prosecutor's job is. A prosecutor's job is to do the right thing. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think most of the prosecutors, they want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Now, we may disagree about what the right thing is, yeah. but most of them have altruistic motives and uh, they, they take their responsibilities very, very seriously. And did you think that it was more incarceration based or did you think that it was there was more um, available options in terms of what was your philosophy in terms of what you saw and what you believed in recommending because quite frankly you can recommend the sentence and absolutely what, what it is that should happen in a specific, a specific case I'm a big believer that the, the prosecutor is the most powerful actor in the criminal justice system many times more powerful than the judge because number one the prosecutor gets to select what cases enter the criminal justice system mm -hmm. just to begin with the prosecutor also gets to choose what charges this particular defendant are charged with. Is this a robbery or is this a theft? Is this an aggravated assault or is this a simple assault? So when they're arrested, that case is then coming to you. So, they, they, you know, John or Jane Smith is on the street. They commit what they think is a theft. The police arrest this individual and then that case comes up to the prosecutor's office and then you take that case over at that point. Right, so just because the police charge someone with a specific crime doesn't mean that's gonna be the final crime that somebody winds up with. Um, so every case that, I'm gonna say felony again, even though you're right, uh, every case that is a felony um, goes, into, goes to the county prosecutor's mm -hmm. office in the county in which it's, the crime is alleged to have been committed in most circumstances. Uh, at that point, there's a prosecutor who can basically do one of three things with a case. The prosecutor can review the evidence and decide to dismiss the case, and sometimes that happens. Sometimes um, there are, the, the evidence just isn't there. Sometimes the prosecutor makes a judgment call that this is more of a civil matter rather than a criminal matter, but it's rare that mm -hmm. the decision to dismiss is made at that point. The, the second two options are more common. So. One option is the prosecutor can treat it like a felony. Mm -hmm. And in that case, New Jersey has a constitutional right to presentation to the grand jury, uh, which a lot of people misunderstand what a grand jury is. Uh, it, it's a, a step in the charging process, but it is not a determination of guilt or innocence. Mm -hmm. The grand jury is 23 people. They're picked for jury duty just like everybody else's. They get the rectangle piece of paper in the mail. But instead of a grand juror being assigned to just one case or a trial, they come in for you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 16, 18 weeks. They uh, have cases presented to them by the prosecutor, and their only job is to determine whether there is just probable cause for the case to proceed. Mm -hmm. um, it's also not an open proceeding. The public's not uh, allowed to be in the grand jury setting. It's a secret proceeding. Um, the defense attorney's not going to be there. A judge isn't going to be there. It's just mm -hmm. the prosecutor and the grand jury. And the prosecutor gets to select what evidence is presented to the grand jury and what charges the grand jury considers. Uh, so it's, it's an incredibly one-sided event. On the other hand, it's not evidence of guilt. It, mm -hmm. It's just a charge. It's just an allegation. And in theory, it's there to separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. But um, in practice, uh, cases are almost uh, routinely indicted. It's exceedingly rare that a grand jury would refuse to indict a case. Mm -hmm. The other option the prosecutor has, they can treat it as a felony and indict it, or they can change the charge mm -hmm. to, um, I'll say misdemeanor, even though, again, you're <laughs> correct, it's not, it's, it's called an offense, uh, but change the charge to a misdemeanor. So, you know, a classic example would be, let's say somebody is found to have uh, 55 grams of marijuana mm -hmm. on, on them. Uh, and there's nothing in particular that indicates it's for distribution or anything like that, it's just for personal use. Well, 
Uh, anything over 50 grams of marijuana is a felony in New Jersey. But me, sitting as a prosecutor, if I'm reviewing that case and there's nothing particularly egregious about this person, uh, I may not want to spend the resources of my office on prosecuting mm -hmm. somebody uh, for 55 grams of marijuana when they're five grams over what would be a felony uh, felony weight of significance. So I may decide that I'm going to change the charge and just charge them on that first uh, 49 grams of marijuana and send it back to municipal court. So you have the power to say, hey, you know, we don't want to deal with it up here in Superior Court. We're going to move it down to municipal court. Yeah, and 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 by the way, that's that's common in many, many cases. For instance, if um, uh, you know, prosecutors who uh, are charged with prosecuting domestic violence cases, which are, uh, which oftentimes can be heart-wrenching cases, they're very emotional cases. A lot of times, the prosecutor has to consider um, the evidence because many times there's a victim who will not testify in open court, refuses to cooperate with the process. That's a factor that the prosecutor has to consider, even in particularly egregious cases. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the prosecutor really every day has to make those judgment calls. And many times there's no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. It's an opinion. Uh, so it's a powerful position in the criminal justice system. And eventually you decided to leave the prosecutor's office and go back out into, you know, the... Saving the world. Saving the world. Saving the world. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that as soon as we come back from the break. Great. Um, uh, we'll talk, talk to Perry, uh, Rob Perry, as soon as we finish uh, this commercial break. We'll see you soon. NTV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing your personal and company's brand awareness. But what is your brand? According to Forbes, it's a combination of your logo, your product, your design and feel, and your personality. Did you know that aside from being a guest, we offer even more opportunity to boost your brand? Adding your company logo and website on screen during your interview will allow viewers to recognize your brand instantly. Incorporating images and video clips is another great way to showcase your product during your live segment. Let viewers see how good you really are. And most importantly, there's you and your interview. For less than the cost of a newspaper, direct mail, or a magazine ad, you can leave our studio and within 48 hours have a permanent digital copy of your live segment to link to your social media, embed into your company website, or use in email marketing. Investing in your brand is so very important, and we can't wait to have you as a guest. Shelter dogs aren't broken. They've simply experienced more life. If they were human, we would call them wise. They would be the ones with tales to tell and stories to write. The ones dealt a bad hand who responded with courage. Do not pity a shelter dog. Adopt one. Say we've got grit and we'll take it as a compliment because it's our uncommon drive, our spark within that brings us together and sets us apart. We are temple made. And when others take shortcuts, when others take breaks, when others take the easy way, we take charge. Add us on social media to watch bloopers, behind the scenes footage, previews, and more. I work 13 hours a day, six days a week. So when I'm off the clock, I gotta get stuff done. So when I need a snack, I need something healthy, tasty, and easy to eat. Like wonderful pistachios without the shells. They're protein powered, delicious, and great on the go. And that's perfect for me. Thanks, Liz. A woman without a lot of time. 
Whether you're a gourmet cook or just want to eat like one, visit Rostelli Market Fresh, your home for the freshest locally sourced ingredients to please everyone who loves great food. Our organic meats, quality seafood, and free-range poultry are cut fresh to order. Chefs create culinary-inspired prep foods made fresh every day, which pair nicely with our vast selection of fine wines and spirits. Choose from handmade pastas, artisan cheeses, organic produce, and grocery items, all from the finest purveyors. Rostelli Market Fresh, from our family to yours. RVN TV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing your personal and company's brand awareness. But what is your brand? According to Forbes, it's a combination of your logo, your product, your design and feel, and your personality. Did you know that aside from being a guest, we offer even more opportunity to boost your brand? Adding your company logo and website on screen during your interview will allow viewers to recognize your brand instantly. Incorporating images and video clips is another great way to showcase your product during your live segment. Let viewers see how good you really are. And most importantly, there's you and your interview. For less than the cost of a newspaper, direct mail, or a magazine, Welcome back. I'm Rebecca Berger. This is Justice for All, and we're here with Robert Perry. He's talking about his experience in the prosecutor's office and how he's now transitioned to the public realm and has left the prosecutor's office. So what was the transition like when you left the prosecutor's office? So you, you're still in criminal law. Yeah, a tough decision. Tough decision because I, I love being a prosecutor. I, I, I think it's a great job, and uh, it was a very difficult decision for me, but there were, there were a number of factors, not, not the least of which is my, my law partner is, is really my best friend. Uh, we've been friends for almost 20 years. Oh, wow. And he had recently opened up his practice. Uh, he, you know, made, made the, uh, the offer you couldn't refuse. Uh, and it's, it's tough to say no to going into work with your best friend every day. So, you know, I, I made the decision to leave and haven't looked back. It's, they're both, I, I think what a lot of people misunderstand about the criminal justice system is they, they look at one, either the prosecutor or the defense attorney as being the good guy or the bad guy, or, or one as being more important in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. They are both eminently necessary in the criminal justice system. You need really good prosecutors, you need really good defense attorneys and they have to work in harmony. There has to be the push and pull to make sure that uh, victims of crime, uh, that there's accountability for illegal conduct, and there, there also has to be a, a good defense attorney to make sure that the government plays by the rules. So along those lines, are there any cases that you had a difficult time maybe representing somebody because you were a prosecutor? Did you ever find there being an issue? So for me, no. Um, I, I do know that some defense attorneys struggle with that. Uh, for me, no, and, and I don't know what that says about me, but I, I always, uh, I'll say a couple things about that. First of all, it's, it's real easy to form uh, an opinion about somebody who you see on the news mm -hmm. and is charged with something, you know, sometimes something terrible, and it's very easy to form an opinion about those people in the abstract. When you, when you know the person uh, and you have spent time with that person, it, it becomes much more complex. Because Be you get to know them. You get to know them. And not only that, uh, for the vast majority of cases, um, I'm not defending Hannibal Lecter. I'm not defending someone mm -hmm. who is completely antisocial with no redeeming qualities. And most of the time, even where I have a client who did exactly what they're accused of doing, there's context for it. There's some sort of, uh, some sort of facts or circumstances that led them into the position that they were in. Uh, com completely common for individuals who are in the throes of addiction to commit a crime. It's mm -hmm. completely common for a whole host of reasons. Um, you know, that's, that's a story behind what led them to be in the situation they're in. Uh, 
The other thing I would say about it is I, I am a huge believer in the process. Mm -hmm. I, I think that sometimes I'm defending a person and sometimes I'm defending a process. It, 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 you cannot reflexively say this person is guilty, this person mm -hmm. did this. There has to be a process. And the minute we skip past that process for just one person, it becomes that much easier for the next person. Uh, everybody, it, the government has to prove it. If they are going to deprive you of your liberty or brand you a criminal, the government should have to prove it with compelling evidence. And that's the process we're in. And sometimes my role is just to make them prove it. Mm -hmm. So when somebody is incarcerated, what do you think that incarceration, incarceration does? Do you actually think that has been beneficial to that individual, that they actually are, you know, rehabilitated in some way when they go and they are incarcerated? It's a mixed bag. So uh, by and large, incarceration, I, I, I think most people do not have a full view of what incarceration does. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of the people, uh, most people think about it as after someone's been found guilty and they're sentenced. People are incarcerated before they've been found guilty of anything. So some people, you know, they're just, they're, they're going about their life, you know, they go to work, they go home to their families, and then at six o'clock in the morning there's a knock on the door, the police are there, and they're executing a search warrant, and they're arrested, and all of a sudden, life stops for them. Mm -hmm. Life just stops. You know, they're not going to make it to their job. A lot of times they lose their job because they didn't make it to their job. That's a significant impact right off the bat. And it doesn't just affect them. It affects their families. Um, they can lose their homes because they don't have any income coming in anymore. Uh, they're not seeing their kids. So it, just, just before you're even found guilty, being incarcerated takes a toll on everybody involved. There's also the longer someone's incarcerated before their case is, is adjudicated, it, it can have a demoralizing effect. People, you know, even clients who I, th I think are innocent, they're telling me they're innocent. I don't see anything in the evidence that the prosecutor has given me that convinces me otherwise. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many clients have said, I just want this to be over. Mm -hmm. I just want it to be over. And then you have a third aspect of it, which is not only are they incarcerated and the weight of the world is coming down on them, but it's a public accusation. Uh, once you're charged, that's a public document, and the newspapers can print what is in a probable cause statement, which may or may not be true, mm -hmm. but it's out there on the front page of the Burlington County Times or any other publication. So they've been you know, publicly accused, maybe smeared sometimes. Uh, they're incarcerated. They're in uh, financial distress. It really can be the walls coming down around them. So uh, after someone's incarcerated or after someone's case is adjudicated and they're sentenced, you know, that's, that's an important question is whether incarceration is warranted in certain mm -hmm. cases. And I don't pretend to have all the right answers. It's certainly, uh, it's certainly everybody has their opinion and you know, prosecutors will view it one way, a judge may view it a different way and a defense attorney may view it a different way. And there's no, I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer, but- Do you it, think that people are actually rehabilitated though when they go to jail? Very few. Very few, just one guy's opinion, but very mm -hmm. few. I, I think more often than not, uh, it sets people back because, you know, you, you stop and you think about if someone is convicted of a crime, and let's say they don't have to be incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Let's say that they, they're on probation. Um, you start off with, okay, so now you have a criminal conviction on your record, mm -hmm. maybe a felony. Try and get a job. Go ahead and try and get a job and watch what happens. It's very, very difficult to get a job. If you're an employer and you have 30 applicants for a job and five of them have a felony conviction on their record, that may be the easiest decision that employer makes that day. Mm -hmm. Now I've got 25 applicants. So even a conviction has a meaningful impact. It can preclude you from a whole host of things, can preclude you from getting certain licenses if you, you know, if you want to be uh, a, me a medical professional, mm -hmm. if you want to work in you know, real estate, these are all issues that are going to hinder your employment opportunities going forward. So then you tack on that we've taken someone out of society 
for a number of years, and now we're putting them back into society and saying, ba effectively, good luck. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Go be good. Don't but break do the law. do you think it's necessary sometimes, given, Obviously. given sometimes Obviously. the level of someone's crime? Obviously. You, you have to have incarceration as a component of the criminal justice system. Um, there are certain individuals who have antisocial personalities, and there are certain pr individuals who are dangerous mm -hmm. to the general public. Uh, society needs to be protected. I'm, I am not, uh, you know, waving waving my fist saying we need to abolish jails. We need incarceration as a component of the criminal justice system. I think the question, and it's an important question that we should keep talking about, is how frequently should we be incarcerating people? Uh, what types of crimes should we be incarcerating people for? For instance, are we going to make a distinction between violent offenses and nonviolent offenses? Mm -hmm. So. In that vein, New Jersey recently changed their bail system, isn't that yes. correct? Yes, yes. So explain how that's made a difference in, in terms of incarceration with when people are arrested. It's made a lot of difference. So let's start, let's, let's start with a little history lesson. So before, before January 1st of 2017, if you're arrested for a crime, uh, a lot of times there would be bail, and bail's not a punishment, it's a down payment to make sure you show up to court effectively. Mm -hmm. The theory behind it is if you give the court $10,000 and the only way you're getting that $10,000 back is if you show up to all your court appearances, then you'll show up to court. Yeah, so, <laughs> it's going to ensure that. Right. The, New Jersey is typically ahead of the curve with a lot of legal issues, and in particular in the criminal justice system. And what New Jersey studied uh, and effectively followed some other states and the federal government and came to the conclusion that there's an inherent unfairness in bail. So if you are successful in life, if you're a lawyer or a doctor or a titan of industry and you have to give $10,000 so you don't have to go to county jail, you'll come up with the $10,000. You can do it. There were people who were sitting in county jail because they couldn't come up with $500 or $100 sometimes. And there's an unfairness about that. Two and it could have been just very, you know, a shoplifting, a shoplifting. so to speak, as compared yeah. to someone who committed murder. Right, right. If you commit murder and your bail is a million dollars, um, and I, I had a client who was charged with murder when we had bail. The bail was close to a million dollars. They figured it out. Uh, there were people who can't come up with a little bit of money. So there's an unfairness in that. It, it becomes economically unfair. Uh, so New Jersey rev converted to what is basically a risk system. So the first thing that happens when you're, when you're charged is a decision by the police uh, and or the prosecutor where they decide whether you're charged on a complaint summons or a complaint warrant. And on its face, they look almost identical. They're just, it's a complaint. It tells you what charges you're, cr what crimes you're charged with, what the bare bones facts are that are alleged, um, but there's either an S or a W. And if it's an S, that means it's a complaint summons. In that case, they hand you the piece of paper. They say, hey, here's your court date. Make sure you show up to court. Have a nice day. If it's a complaint warrant, then you're going to jail. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. I don't care if you're Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, you're going to jail because it's mm -hmm. on a warrant. The, in simple terms, the sequence of events is they get you in front of a judge. The prosecutor has to either say, yes, judge, we want them detained, we want them locked up while the case continues, or the prosecutor's gonna say, no, judge, we're okay with you releasing this person. If they say that they want you detained, you're entitled to a hearing on that. And there, a judge is going to make a decision. Either you're going to be released or you're going to be held in jail without bail. And make this it. isn't a trial. This no. is just, and it's not an adjudication on the actual facts of the, no. of the, of the crime. No, I mean, that plays, there's several factors that the court mm -hmm. considers. And one of the factors is the, the nature and circumstances of the offense, or the facts of the case, uh, the strength of the proofs. But effectively what the judge is determining, is considering two issues. The first issue is what is the likelihood that this person is going to flee the jurisdiction? So when someone, uh, before anybody gets in front of the judge, they run a report. 
the courts run a report. It's called a public safety assessment, and it gives you two numbers, one between one and six. One is really good for my clients, mm -hmm. six is really bad for my clients, mm -hmm. and most people fall somewhere in between there. So the first number has to do with what's the likelihood you're going to flee. So have you have you ever, uh, do you have a criminal history? That may factor into the decision. Have you missed court? Uh, everything down to what's your age? Because younger people tend to, you know, make more boneheaded decisions than older people. So all of this information is plugged into what is almost an algorithm, and it spits out these numbers. One's for risk to fail to appear. The other one is, are you going to commit a new crime while you're released? Again, one through six. So six is if you're going to commit six a new crime. Six is we you think you're going to go out and rob a bank. Okay. And then, you know, one is we think you're fine. So the the numbers are not controlling. There's no magic formula. Like if you're a five, you stay in. If you're a two, you get out. But they're instructive to the judge. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the, the, the system is designed, or at least the procedure is designed, to have more people released pre-adjudication. To have more people. So the people on the who maybe were arrested for shoplifting, as compared to a robbery, right? Um, and they don't have the money to get out of, you know, county jail, so to speak, are not sitting in there for long periods of time. Exactly. So the you start off with the judge. The presumption in the law, unless you're charged with murder or something that's uh, you could get life in prison for, is that you're going to be released, and the prosecutor has to prove that you should be incarcerated. And if the judge uh, decides to release you, then you're released, and you, you know, the case goes in an ordinary track. Now, if you're locked up, if you're detained, then the prosecutor, well, the courts impose speedy trial deadlines, which are, are very are tight, relatively speaking. They seem like a long time, but in the criminal justice system, they're light and fast. If you're locked up. The prosecutor only has 90 days to present your case to the grand jury and get an indictment, and then only has 180 days to bring your case to trial. So you add those numbers up, and you get about nine months. So from time of arrest to the trial, the prosecutor's got about nine months to bring your case to trial. So it sounds like bail review has actually made a difference in the criminal justice system at this point. Yeah, there's different points of view. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of people who are very upset because individuals who would normally be incarcerated uh, who are charged with very serious crimes are not incarcerated right now and a mm -hmm. lot of people think that's wrong uh, on the other hand you have a lot of people who are charged with crimes who would normally be incarcerated really for financial reasons who are released uh, pre-adjudication so uh, there, there's certainly there's no, two, no happy media there's <laughs> no, a, 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 somebody's gonna be unhappy with everything so, so. If somebody wanted to get a hold of you and use your services, what's your firm's website? Oh, it's uh, www.rosenbergperry.com. And uh, we look, we always give, if you run into a problem, give us a call. We never charge for consultations. We'll answer all your questions. And what is your phone number? 609-216-7400. Rob, I want to thank you for being here. It's so enjoyable to hear your experience and to get the information that you've provided because I think it's really important. And I look forward to seeing everybody next week. That's it for tonight.